chapter number one. Nehemiah chapter number one. I think that the Lord is leading me to this new study through the book of Nehemiah. For those of you that have a really good memory, I think I preached through the book of Nehemiah. Could be close to 20 years ago. So if you still have those outlines, hold on to them and, and uh, keep up with them. Um, but uh, we're going to go, I think, Lord willing, verse by verse, through this Old Testament book of Nehemiah. We're going to certainly, as we begin in chapter number one, I just want to speak to you on this subject. This is really a title from O.S. Hawkins, but I think you could put it over the whole book for sure. It's never too late for a new beginning. It's never too late for a fresh start. Never too late. You follow along with me there in verse number one, Nehemiah chapter one. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, that in the 20th year, that I, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the, in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible, and that word terrible means awesome God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear be now attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I'll scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, that though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet I will gather them from my fence, uh, gather them from fence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. You can be seated. It will, it's hard to believe, but it will soon be a year uh, since what I call, some call an interruption, I call a disruption, uh, that we know as COVID-19. Because about a year ago, it began to change life as we know it, didn't it? In our country, in our communities, in a lot of different ways. We all know too well how it has affected everything. Um, I know that these past 11 or 12 months have been incredibly difficult for a lot of people. There's been a lot of economic loss. There's been a lot of sickness. There's been a lot of death. There's been a lot of division. And with all that being said, I cannot think of a better place to start. I think finishing up the book of Revelation. And beginning here in the book of Nehemiah, which is all about rising out of difficulty, overcoming obstacles, and, and fulfilling, continuing to fulfill what God has called us to do. Listen to these words by a 19th century preacher by the name of F.B. Meyer. He says this, he says, it's a mistake to be always turning back to recover the past. The law for Christian living is not backward, but forward. Not for experiences that lie behind, 
but for doing the will of God, which is always ahead, and beckoning us to follow. When I consider the work that, that God called Nehemiah to do, when I consider uh, what he faced, and, and you know, he wasn't recruited for this, he was a volunteer. I think God's still looking for volunteers in his army. Do you, do you believe that? Nehemiah was a volunteer. He said, I'll be willing to go. And when I think about what, how God used him, in spite of all kinds of challenges, persecution on the outside, persecution on the inside, when I think about that, it, it gives me kind of a surge of spiritual energy. Because I think all of us would, would agree with this fact. A lot of us need our batteries recharged. Wouldn't you agree? I remember I used to be a lot more familiar with battery cables than I am now. When Dawn and myself first got married, everything we drove was an adventure. <laughs> Whether you, you always carried certain things with you, you carried a fix a flat, you carried a, a battery cables, you had to be ready for whatever came your way. And the most disappointing thing is, is, is being there and the car not being able to start. So at least you got to have battery cables with you. At least you can find some willing participant to help you maybe start your car. And I'd say a lot of us, a lot of us need our batteries restarted, recharged, spiritual energy. And I think that we get that and find that a lot from the book of Nehemiah. Now let me just kind of, before we get into the text, let me just kind of set the stage because you gotta, you got to understand the Bible in its context. A little bit about the history. Well, some folks say, I don't care anything about history. Well, you got one. Everybody's got a history, right? So for those that say, I don't really care about history. Well, everybody's got a history. And you got to know sometimes to understand the Bible, the historical setting of what we're talking about. As it happened so many times in the nation of Israel with their leaders, a lot of times it started out good, and then they had an unfortunate ending. For example, Solomon started out well, but under his leadership and because he did a lot of things that God told him not to do, even though he was one of the wisest men, he got away from God and the, the kingdom that he was leading it divided. You had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was known as Judah. The northern kingdom was known as Israel. Lots of the northern kingdom was absorbed into a lot of the Assyrian countries, but certainly the southern kingdom was much of which returned to the city of Jerusalem that we read about in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Many returned to their homeland somewhere around 538 B.C. under the leadership of a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And they completed rebuilding the temple in 515 B.C. And then a second group came led by Ezra in the time of 458 BC. And, and when they got there, they found everything in disarray. And the reason they found everything in disarray, there was a lot of spiritual immorality, moral degradation. That's the reason Ezra and Nehemiah spent a lot of time renewing everything spiritually. In fact, in the book of Nehemiah, the first part is about rebuilding the walls. And then the last part is about, in essence, rebuilding the people. But I believe there's even a personal application for you and me when we talk about the walls of Jerusalem. I want you to listen to this Old Testament scripture, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15 and 16. Can a woman forget her nursing child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Even they may forget, but I will not forget thee. This is the, what the Lord says. Behold, I have graven, and that word graven means I have inscribed thee on the palm of my hands. Thy laws are continually before me. Now, Chuck Swindoll in his book, Hand Me Another Brick, makes a personal application about the rebuilding the walls to our own lives. He, he said what the walls were to Jerusalem. Our lives are before God. He went on to say that some of us are living within the walls of our lives surrounded by ruin. And it all began very slowly. Maybe it was a piece of mortar that fell out or a block that cracked. And then the crack began to become a hole and then there was sod maybe that began to grow in the wall. It all happened through neglect. And isn't that the way that it happens in our spiritual lives? Nobody, I don't think, ever gets up 
on any given day and I'm just going to completely walk away from my family. I'm going to sin against God. I'm going to do what lots of times we see happen. But what happens is you do a process oftentimes with spiritual neglect. He went on to say, such things as selfishness, lack of discipline, procrastination, immorality, no time for God, compromise and rebellion have came and sowed their ugly seeds. And I think it's fair to say that in this day, many of us, without meaning to, have become spiritually lethargic in a lot of ways. And we've let the walls of our life kind of become in disarray. Because that's what happens sometimes through neglect has crept in and we've offered more excuses than answers. And I'm just here to remind you that one of the main things of this book is that it is never too late for a fresh start. I can't remember who said it, but this is a quote that I read a long time ago. The, Christian, the victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. You fall down and get back up. The proverb says a righteous man will fall down seven times and he'll get right back up. So being victorious, it's not about never falling. It's not about never going through struggle, but it's about getting back up. And it's a series of new beginnings. Hey, listen to what the Word said. I, I believe as we outline this text and we get rolling through this book that challenges me as a leader, and I want to challenge you as a Christian, that we not only see the gospel in here, but we get instruction for how to overcome obstacles and how to live by faith and how to make prayer a priority in our life that oftentimes is not in our lives. I want you to notice four things this morning that I'm going to call your attention here. In the first chapter that I think just kind of set the whole tone of the book. What are some of the first things you got to do to have a fresh start? What are some of the first steps you got to take? Well, I believe, first of all, you got to not be afraid to ask the hard questions. You got to not be afraid to ask the hard questions. Have you ever asked somebody a question and you're really not interested in what they have to say? You know, sometimes we get in the habit of saying, Well, how are you doing? And when we ask that question, we're not, a lot of times you're not really interested. Because then when somebody begins to really tell you how they're doing it, you really got more information than you wanted to know, didn't you? <laughs> so it's, it's not being afraid to ask the hard question and being willing to do something when you get the answer. I want you to notice what Nehemiah says here, verse 2 and 3. He talks about one of his brethren that came, and he and certain men of Judah, and he asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped. Now, mind you, Nehemiah was hundreds of miles, depending on who you read, some say 700, some say 1,000, but he was hundreds of miles from Jerusalem. He was in Persia, so to speak, Assyria. But he asked them about those that had escaped, those that had returned after the Babylonian captivity to the city of their God concerning Jerusalem. And this is, what, this is the answer that he got. The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Great affliction and reproach. That word affliction means distress. They were in great distress, great reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. No security, no safety, no protection from the enemy. It's a bad situation. And that's what happens when the walls of our life begin to crumble a little bit. You cannot be afraid to ask the hard questions. Nehemiah cared enough to ask. And I will tell you he was really concerned. You know how I know that he was concerned? Because after he got the answer, the Bible says he sat down. Have you ever had anybody tell you something and they say, you need to sit down? That's bad. You know that's bad from the get-go, right? You need to sit down. He sat down. And he mourned and he fasted several days. That was his response to the news that he got. God's people were in serious trouble. They were disgraced before the Gentiles and the walls and the gates were broken down and burned. 
Now he could have said, he could have had this attitude, well, you know, maybe somebody will come along and help them. Maybe somebody will do their part. I'm here. You know, he had a pretty good position, pretty cushy job. I'm not really interested. He could have said that. Leave that to someone else. He could have told Hannah and I, said, listen, the next time you go, let me send you some money and you take to help those people. But that's not the response. And this is what, this is what we need to hear this morning. I want you to listen to this statement. Oftentimes, burden precedes blessing. Burden precedes blessing. You know the reason Nehemiah was so concerned? You know the reason he was willing to go? Because he was burdened about the condition, not only of the city, but the people of the city. I'm sure that he had thought about and prayed about Jerusalem many times. As D.L. Moody said about Nehemiah, if you could have bored a hole into his head, you would have found Jerusalem stamped on his brain. If you could have looked into his heart, you would have found Jerusalem even there. And that ought to be, well, how should we respond to that? When it comes to heaven, when people look at our mind, when people look at our heart, heaven ought to be stamped on our heart. Our affection should be set on things above, not on things here below. But that was the way that was the way in Nehemiah. We're not afraid to ask the hard questions. And sometimes that's hard. I, I mean, sometimes when we, we look at our lives, when we look at the spiritual situation and the spiritual condition, sometimes it's hard to ask the hard question. But I believe you've got to do that. But I believe, secondly, not only can you not be afraid to ask the hard question, but you can't be ignorant or indifferent. What's worse, not knowing or not caring? Probably caring that you don't know. Or not caring that you don't know. We cannot be ignorant or indifferent. Some prefer not to know what's going on. Some prefer not to know what the real situation is in any circumstance because information would bring obligation. Things might have been bad, but they didn't have to stay that way. And Nehemiah was going to do his part. What would happen in any church if we all did our part? What would happen in any fellowship of believers if every member, every child of God did their part? Nehemiah was more than willing and more than able to do his. Now, he was concerned about the people, but I tell you, I believe when you read his prayer, his greater concern was for the glory of God. He was concerned because the city of Jerusalem was the city of God. And if it was in reproach, then it was not bringing glory to God. So in essence, when you read Nehemiah's prayer, and, and Nehemiah's a book about prayer too, there are 12 instances of Nehemiah praying throughout the book. Some of them are long prayers, long recorded prayers. Most of them are very short. But he was a man driven and dominated with a praying heart. When I read that, I, asked, I wrote this statement down and I kind of convicted my heart. And for most of this, most of us, I believe it's true. It's probably been a long time since we sat out and wept about anything that didn't directly concern us. Do you hear what I say? It's probably been a long time since any of us have sat down and mourned and fasted and wept if it did not directly concern us, unless it was something about one of our loved ones or our family members or our circumstance or our job. And that's one reason we can tell that if self-centered Self-centeredness dominates our lives because we're not bothered about the welfare of others. Nehemiah could have easily turned a deaf ear, turned his head. But he didn't. He was not indifferent. He asked a hard question. But I want you to know he took personal responsibility. He took personal responsibility. This prayer that Nehemiah prayed. He was claiming the promises of God. 
He was not reminding God because God never forgets anything, but he was certainly basing on the promise of God that if God's people were obedient, they did what they were supposed to do. It was a covenant promise that God would bless them and provide for them. So they were back in the city of God. They were back where they were supposed to be. And he was basically praying the scriptures over this situation. God, you provide. You give us what we need to get there and get the job done. Give me favor with the king so I might be able to go. And you work everything out. You say, what do you mean by taking personal responsibility? I want you to look again at this prayer that Nehemiah prayed. It says, it came to pass when I heard these words, he sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray for before thee now. Day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel. Listen to what he says. Which we have sinned against thee. My father's house have sinned. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee. I want you to know Nehemiah was hundreds of miles away and he's so associated with what was going on in the city of Jerusalem, he realized that he was as much his fault as the people that were there. He took personal responsibility for his own sin. You know, Daniel prayed a similar way. Ezra prayed a similar way when they included their, themselves in the sin of the nation. Everyone likes to blame someone else for their current problems. But Nehemiah didn't do that, did he? Nehemiah said, well, if Nebuchadnezzar had to did what he did, we wouldn't have the problems we've got. Or he could have said if Zerubbabel had been more effective in getting the job done, it wouldn't be the mess that it was in. But that's not what he said. He took personal responsibility and identified with the situation. So what am I saying? If change comes to any situation, you've got to take personal responsibility. Listen, it's not always somebody else's fault. I realize it can be, but we live in a world where everybody's got to blame somebody else. Republicans blame the Democrats, Democrats blame the Republicans, husband blames wife, wife blame husband, children blame parents. It, we've always got somebody to blame. Instead of us just saying, Lord, I am the one standing in need of prayer. You've got to take personal responsibility. That's what Nehemiah did. He said, we have sinned. I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly. We're often harder on everybody else than we are our own sins. Are we not? Come on now. We're harder on everybody else than we are. We've got two different standards. There's everybody else and then there's us. In fact, to quote the wise man, George W. Bush, he says, too often we judge other groups by their worst examples while judging ourselves by our best intentions. Think about that. That sums it up, doesn't it? We really, really struggle with personal responsibility. It's always someone else's fault. Well, hey, we've all been hurt by other people. We've all been affected by things others have done. But oftentimes, if to get a fresh start, to get a new start, to begin to rebuild the walls of my life spiritually, I've got to take personal responsibility. Listen, it's never too late for a new beginning. It's never too late for a fresh start. We've got to be willing to ask the hard question. We've got to certainly not be indifferent. We've got to take personal responsibility. And the last thing that you need to see here, you've got to commit to do whatever that it takes. Because that's what brings about genuine change in any situation. Don't you agree? Look at the last 
verse that we read in that chapter, in verse 11, it says there in Nehemiah's words, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now, what was he praying about? He needed, he needed the freedom to be able to go to Jerusalem, to leave the palace, to leave his position. The king had to give him the freedom to do that. So he's praying, Lord, I, I can't do that. You have to do that. And then he adds to it, he says, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now, what exactly does that mean? Now, to be a cupbearer, you know, he, he was not praying for God to send someone else. Lord, here I, here I am, send somebody else. That's not what he was praying. He was willing to go, but he knew that he would have to request a leave of absence from the king, and this was going to be a major test of faith. He was a cupbearer. You know what that was? He actually, a, a great uh, position. Kind of dangerous. He would taste the food and the wine for the king to see if it was poisonous. I don't know what the turnover was in that, that position, but you would think with all the treachery and all the stuff that went on, but you'd have to have somebody you trust, wouldn't you? You wouldn't want anybody that you just pretended to taste your food and say, oh, it's okay. So he was a man of character. He was a man of great position. Interacting with the king. So he would be leaving. Listen to this. He would be leaving the comfort of the palace. Kind of a cushy life. I, you might say, well, I don't think I want that job. But it was a cushy job. It was a, it was a great job. And he was leaving the comfort of the palace to go to a ruined city. And as Wearsby said, he said, luxury would be replaced by ruins, prestige by ridicule and slander. Listen, folks. Sometimes for there to be a fresh work of God in any situation, you know what we got to do? we got to be willing to leave that which makes us feel so comfortable and get out maybe in an area we've never been before. And that scares a lot of us today. Commit to do whatever it takes. You know what's interesting about this is there was a four-month time period. Four months between the end of chapter one and chapter two. Four months. So as he prayed and asked God to work and to move, he certainly waited. He waited four months to bring this before the king. To bring this before the king. So the ultimate question is this morning, is there some, re is there some wall rebuilding that you need to do in your life? The walls are broken down. Some wall rebuilding you need to do. Do you need a fresh start? I think that's what Nehemiah, that's the reason. Chapter 1 is chapter 1. It's never too late to get a fresh start. It's never too late for a new beginning, as O.S. Hawkins says. Never too late. I believe as long as you're breathing, there's hope for you. God's got a plan for you. God wants to use you. And me too. Well, today you can get that fresh start. It may be a simple thing. Maybe, maybe your spiritual life's in disarray because you've let some habits fall by the wayside. But most of the time when we talk about rebuilding walls in our life and, and, and getting a new start, most of the time we know exactly what it is, don't we? Because that's how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. Maybe this morning you need the Lord Jesus as your Savior. That's a new start. The Bible says you become a new 
creation. A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And that's the gospel that Jesus Christ died for you and rose again so that you could have eternal life. But you have to believe it's all been done. Christ has done the work. You have to believe and repent and trust him and he will change your heart without a doubt. Without a doubt. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you.